Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go to Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. Can't ever lose going to Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, can you? Hallelujah. Neen, good to see you tonight. We missed you this morning. Hallelujah. No, I was, you know, I just, um, it was good to see him, you know, like we said this morning, uh, Janice's friend came this morning, but she was my neighbor in our old neighborhood, hadn't, you know, hadn't seen him in, well, we've been in our new house about 14, 15 years, I don't think I've seen her since then, um, but um, she came to visit this morning, I think she got ministered to. I, I'll be honest with you, I told, I told the kids on the way home, I said, now, I kind of, all I could get was kind of a skeleton for this morning. And when I got to ministering and saying things in ministry, I was, something was pulled on it. And, um, and then after talking to Janice after service, some things and things that were said, uh, I, I realized that, that, you know, the things I said and the way I was ministering was directly because, because somebody was pulling and her, 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 our old neighbor and her friend was, were pulling on the, the, um, the anointing. I tell you, if we pull on the anointing, one thing we can't get do is complacent to where we're just kind of, you know, settled that, well, I get this, I get that there. We need to pull. You have an expectancy and demand so that the, that the, the anointing will flow. And you can always tell when, when somebody is fresh in the building that's really pulling because it's really feeding them. Um, it just, it just kind of, you, you can't keep up with it. Yeah. Now, we, as we get older, should learn how to um, consistently make that same demand so we can walk in deeper places. So that God can bring a, a deeper revelation to our life about things. So we can walk in a higher plane with him. Amen. Nothing weird, nothing new. But, but, you know, when I say there's nothing new in the sun, it's all already in here. Amen. Maybe new to us, but it's not new. Amen. Hallelujah. Because it's already been established in the word. Praise God. All right. We'll read Mark 11. We'll start here in verse 12. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. Now, why did the Bible put that in there? Because when the fig had leaves, it would say that it had fruit. The, 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 God doesn't do things accidentally. He could, just, he could just inspired Mark to write, you know, he's seeing a fig tree afar off, came upon it, that he might find figs on it, you know, having leaves. There was an importance in that, those two words being in there, because when a fig tree bears leaves, it bears fruit together. Okay? And so having leaves on it, he, he came happily if he might find anything there only. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for the time of the figs was not yet. Now, what, what's that mean? You know, it was, it, was supposed, it was showing leaves. It was declaring that it had something, but it didn't. Right. Jesus would have known that at the times of the fig weren't yet. He would have, they would have all known that. But because it had leaves, he came if happily. Maybe there are some on there. It's got leaves. Maybe there are some. And uh, he answered it. Now, what this victory says, I got figs. And Jesus answered it. You don't have figs. So, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. Now, they go on about their business. They come back out. Um, and in the morning, on verse 20, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, this word morning, uh, actually, this phrase could be interpreted. Um, I don't, my mic's a little hot in the house. Just a little bit. Um, um, could also mean uh, sometime later. Didn't necessarily mean that it was the next morning. Okay? All right? If it was the next morning, everybody would have been excited. But, you know, they probably walked by that fig tree a few times, and they just sat there and sat there and sat there. When they came out, it was dried up from the roots. And then Peter answered and said, I mean, Peter called to remembrance unto him, Master, behold the fig tree. Now, you kind of, so you kind of got to think that's kind of what it meant. If he's calling to remembrance to him, it wouldn't have been the next morning. He would have known he did it yesterday. All right? And um, so Peter calling to remembrance to him, said, Master, behold the fig tree, you curse is withered away. Jesus answering and saith unto him, now he doesn't even address what he says in, the, in that sense. He's now going to take the opportunity to teach an object lesson. Thank God for object lessons. Amen. Have faith in God or have the, God of, the faith of God, then it can be uh, translated that way, or the God kind of faith. All right. So number one, he says here that the ability to speak and get results is faith. 
So we have to read, we have to look deeper. Can't just look on the surface. Oh, Jesus worked a miracle. He cursed the fig tree and died. No, Jesus took that as an object lesson, a opportunity to teach an object lesson to his disciples. And he said, have the faith of God. Now, have faith in God or have the faith of God. Can we translate the Greek? You know, if you look, some Bibles will say, um, mine actually has, it says, uh, you know, or the Greek says, have the faith of God. Okay? And then now Jesus is going to describe how the faith of God works. First of all, he tells them, now think about this now, when he said that, have the faith of God. He cursed the fig tree, it spoke words, and those words caused something to happen in this realm. When Peter says, you cursed the fig tree and it died, Jesus just turns right around and goes, have the faith of God. So now what Jesus is doing there, you got, just like I said, you got to look a little bit deeper. Jesus was saying, you could do the same thing with words. Have the faith of God. For verily, now verily is, a strong, is as strong of a word you can say uh, in the Elizabethan language as I swear. It's a solemn oath. Verily I say unto you that whosoever. Now here's the beautiful thing. You know, people say, you know, uh, I remember one time when we were uh, back in Greenville, we were playing church league softball. That's where all baseball players go when they don't go anywhere else. They go play church league softball or industrial league softball or something, you know. Uh, you got to change that baseball swing to a softball swing, and usually it don't work. You know, you, you know, you can kill it, but it's a line drive, and it don't go anywhere. You know, <clears throat> and uh, we we had a guy get hurt at second base sliding, and so we went and we we were praying for him, and um, and one of the guys there from the other team that I knew, uh, he was he got kind of upset about. It. I said, well, you know, the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. He said, that's only God. Well, really. Jesus said here, whosoever. He didn't say only God. He said, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Now, I know he's speaking allegorically or using typology. But he says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Mountains represent issues or things in life that are big, that are so big that it looks impossible to surmount. And they are mountains in our life. Sickness, you know, uh, getting, getting, getting uh, called into the doctor's office and told you're going to die in six months is a mountain. Probably not Mount Everest in your thinking. Okay? But he says, whosoever. Everybody say, I'm a whosoever. Shall say unto this mountain, be thou cast into the sea, be removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt where? In your heart. Faith does not work in your head. Now, the renewing of the mind helps you think right, but faith is in the heart. Are you here? Faith is in the heart. It, the, the entrance to the heart is through the soul. So as you renew the mind, the word filters down or goes into your heart. Faith, but faith is birthed or released out of the heart of man. So he shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. Now, here we are with that faith. That, you know, the root word for believe and faith come out of the same word. Um, so, who shall, shall believe that those things which he does what? Saith. Shall come to pass and have whatsoever he saith. So here Jesus comes and goes, and I, you know, fig tree, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. They go and come, go and come, go and come, go and hunt, come. Like I said, when you, stu you study the word and in the morning, that phraseology in the Greek can mean uh, 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 at a future time or another time. It could have meant weeks, maybe months later. I don't know. But Peter called to remembrance and said, the fig tree, you curse is withered away. Jesus answered his statement and said this, have faith in God, or have the faith of God. And then he goes on to describe how the faith of God works. That whosoever... Now remember, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking about people who are of the kingdom of God but whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever. So whosoever gets whatsoever he saith. Now, we know, now let me, let me bring a little balance to this, because somebody run off the deep end, they'll go around and start confessing to everybody else's wife or their car or their house. Paul wrote further in doctrine to the church. He said over in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, he said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The only way you're going to get faith in your heart to believe what you say will come to pass is to find it in God's word. 
So then you can't go believe for somebody's wife. See, if you're going to, remember he said this, whosoever shall say, be thou removed, be thou cast in his heart, and shall, whosoever shall believe in his heart, and say, and then he say, or, or I'm sorry, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things he saith shall come to pass, who have whatsoever he saith. Okay? The only way he could believe that the words he says are going to come to pass and it be the faith of God. Remember, this is, this is under the guise or under the parameters or under the, the, uh, the head title for this section, the faith of God. You can't take Mark eleven twenty three 23 without first taking Mark eleven twenty two. 22. All right? Some people try to go out and teach, this is how human faith works. This is how, you know, natural faith works. You know, if, I, if God wasn't real, if Jesus Christ wasn't real, if the Bible wasn't real, I'd still live this way because it works. I heard one preacher say one time. Well, I'm sorry. You couldn't because what we're talking about here is the faith of God. This is how the faith of God works. That means it's not going to work outside the parameters of his word. You're not going to have faith to believe for my car. You're not going to have faith to believe for somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband. You're not going to have faith to believe that you're going to get rich gambling. There's no basis of faith. Are you here? So you get people, start, they, they take 23, run off, they start saying all kinds of stupid stuff. Well, that'll get you in trouble. Actually, it'll undermine your faith. See, not, not following the, the, the prescription of God's word and following the way God laid it out will hurt your faith. You start just confessing a whole bunch of stupid stuff and no basis for faith, you really can't believe it. You're trying to make something happen by just saying a bunch of stuff, power of positive thinking or something. And in reality, the truth of the matter is if it's going to be the faith of God, it's going to have to come from where God says you get it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Can't get it somewhere else. You got to get it from God's word. That's where it comes from. Okay? So what does that mean? Then the faith, the, the ability to believe that whatsoever you say shall come to pass and you shall have it, has to be within the confines or the parameters of God's, what God's word promises. All right? The whatsoever is the whatsoever of what God promises you. Why? Because anything, that, anything outside of what God promises you has no basis to believe. God's word gives us, us the basis to believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thus, we have to stay within the parameters of God's word and what the Holy Spirit may reveal to us in line with God's word to be able to have faith to believe that whatsoever we say we'll get. Are we here? See, and when we do that, instead of being dumb and running off like some bozo you know, it's, it's immaturity does it a lot of times. Just you get all excited and you run off of somebody. You can hear somebody. You know, Dad Hagen used to preach a sermon. He got a little book called um, You Can Have What You Say. When, I, when you go read, you, you can't take the book title and go out and start trying to act on it. Because you can have what you say. When you read the little mini book, you find out in there he's talking about you can have what you say that the word promises you. Amen. You got to read the book. You got to, you know, you got to, and then you got to go study the scriptures that are used in the book. So that, like, like Brother Hagin says, you know, don't take my word for it. He said, go to the word of God for yourself and make God's word your word. Don't take my word and try to make it your word. You know, and you got to find out for yourself what the Bible says. Why? Because that's where faith comes from. It doesn't come from Pastor Ed. It comes from the word of God. Why do we have preachers? We're to, we're to instruct, we're to lead, we're to guide, we're to teach and share what the Word of God says so that you can go and study it out and prove it out for yourself. Be a Berean. Amen? So you can prove it out, know what it says, and then have faith come into your heart that you as a whosoever. Now, if, now this means anybody that will come into the kingdom and operate the principles of the kingdom according to how God said operate them, they'll work for them. Not just the apostle, not just the prophet. Not, there's not a special few that get a special kind of, you know, uh, way of living. I've heard one preacher say, you know, that, that God may call some people to be poor. Hey, actually, just God happened to call him to be rich so he could teach people certain things. Amazing. 
He writes books and gets rich and then tells you that, you know, God has a purpose in you being poor, so just, just put up with it, but keep buying his books. I don't buy that. God's not a respecter of persons. Are you here? Are you here? No, God, God's not looking around to make you poor and make somebody else rich and just teach. What, what, is, what is he going to learn? How's he going to learn his humility if you're having to learn it through being poor? Just, all these kind of things that people say, and I just, it just aggravates me. It's all right. It's fine for you to tell people to be poor when you're living high on the hog. Hello? It's real easy. Kind of like that old story. Remember the story of the chicken and the pig? Looking down the hill at the farmer and his four kids, wife and four kids, and they're down there about to starve. And the, and the uh, um, pig turns to the chicken and says, man, we got to do something about this. The chicken says, you're right. Look, here's what I'm going to do. I'll provide the eggs. You provide the bacon. And the pig looks back at the chicken and says, look, you want to get involved. You want me to get committed. Yeah. Amen. Isn't that right? You know, there's a lot of people who, who, who want to be involved and live great while they expect you to be committed and live, I mean, hand to fist, I mean, paycheck to paycheck, barely get along and buy their books and buy their tapes and buy their MP3s and all that kind of stuff. And they get rich and they, they sit in some kind of self-imposed calling that they're supposed to be rich so they can help teach you how to deal with your humble circumstances. Well, I like for people to, t to teach me something that they've lived. Amen. It's just like when, 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 when remember when, when uh, one of the preachers was running around and all, everybody was telling you, you got to give up. You got to give up to get blessed, you know? And they run around telling everybody, I sat down at so and so's meeting and, and I didn't even preach that week. And people put $25,000 in my pocket during that week convention. And, uh, you know, they get up and brag about how, how they got rich. Well, I'm sorry. You got rich because everybody knew who you were. And you've been out there preaching, giving up, and everybody's trying to go. They all want to get rich. They want to give up. Now, there's nowhere in the Bible that says give up. It says to, to take care of those who minister the word. But it doesn't say you're going to get rich because you gave up. Hello. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote and said, you gave it to my necessity. Therefore, my God will meet your glitches according to his glory in Christ Jesus. Remember he wrote to the Philippian church? He said, because you sent once again into my necessity. Don't sound like somebody who's just hoarding all the money in, packing it up in bags and walking out of the church with it, you know, and telling everybody, I got $25,000, I didn't even preach. If your message won't work for the guy who bops the floor at Walmart, it ain't working for anybody. Are you here? Because my question in those cases are, what about the guy who's working third shift and, uh, and night mopping the floors to get some little extra smack so he can get to work, you know, take care of his family smack. In the old days, it used to mean money. Don't necessarily mean drugs. You know, in the old days, you know, you think I can smack. You're talking about money. That, you know, that's old, my older days. Some of y'all aren't there. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. All right, uh, greenbacks. Working two jobs and all this, working hand to fist. I mean, he's trying to make it. And then you come and say, got to go give to the guy who ain't doing nothing. Give him another $25,000. He got a $2 million house, four-car garage, $25,000 guard dog. And we're supposed to give to him because we got to give up so I can get rich. Something's wrong with that. No. If, if it doesn't work for everybody. See, God's word will work for everybody. Now, there's messages that people preach that won't work for everybody. But the word of God will work for everybody. What do I mean? If you, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what they are, if you will take a hold of the word of God and you as a whosoever go to the word, let faith be birthed in your heart, speak to your mountain, believe in your heart, don't doubt it, don't doubt it, but believe that whatsoever things you say shall come to pass, you'll have whatsoever you say. Because the word, because the word built faith in your heart and now you've acted on the principle that Jesus gave. Amen. It'll work for anybody. I, you know, I love Janice. I, like, I, I kind of like, Janice is my poster child of how God can bring you out and bring you up and establish you and, and make, and, 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 and we tell, you know, let's tell you something. I know I'm mumbling a little bit. I, I'm trying to get to a fault and it's, it's kind of running away from me and trying to catch it. <laughs> Hallelujah. But she, she took a situation that was not good. Probably didn't have at one time any dreams of getting any better. 
When Janice first came to our church, I remember that time she had just gotten a job at McDonald's. Now, I think you, now did you go from McDonald's to the cafeteria, from the cafeteria to McDonald's? Cafeteria. Okay, she had left, I think, the A&T cafeteria? Uh, USC. USCG cafeteria, cafeteria worker. You know, listen, and don't, don't ever think that some of these caf cafeteria workers don't ha have an impact on people's lives. There's a Miss Portia at, at Greensboro College. Nate, yeah. She loves Nathan. <laughs> they just have a good relationship. You know, touching those kids and, and so forth. But Janice has just gotten the job at McDonald's. And then, you know what? Janice ended up being a manager. Yeah. Then Janice got another job. Uh, that, was it from there to I Omega? I now here is Janice. Comes into the church. Working in the fast food industry. But she believed God's word. She began to speak what we preach. She began to act on it. Go to the word of God. Find out for herself. Begin to act on that. And so she moved up from just working to a managerial position at McDonald's. And then I Omega came in over here near Burlington. And they were, they were makers of hard drives and, and, and CD drives and those kind of things. And she went over there and applied for a job. And then got moved out of just working in the place into, in, into an um, administrative position. And then when they, finally, when they finally decided that, you know, the Burlington plant wasn't uh, profitable to them, they were going to shut it down and move to Memphis or, or consolidate with a plant in Memphis. They wanted Janice to go. That's right. She said, I'm not leaving my church. She wouldn't leave her church. They talked her into going out there for six weeks, help train people. They, well, they were trying to get her hooked so they wouldn't, they wouldn't lose her. Now, wait a second. Now, this person just was a cafeteria worker. Started out in cafeteria. Don't have the masters in the PhD. But she knows the master. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you here? See, what? how did this happen? Whosoever shall say unto the mountain, be removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, they have whatsoever they saith. So she goes out there after six weeks, she says, I'm going home. They tried to talk her out of it. They, they, did, they just did everything they could. I got to get back to my church. We missed her those six weeks, so I want you to know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. She came in. She got a job over at another company, and she just moved right on up into there. She, she ain't out there packing crates. She's telling people how to pack their crates. And I believe there's more coming. But that was because of faith. See, the faith of God produced favor with men. And God gave her wisdom where she didn't have wisdom and knowledge where she didn't have knowledge. That's right. And brought her up. Then somewhere along the way, she picked up Jerry. <laughs> she could have picked him up earlier, but she just finally got him when she got him. <laughs> I'd love to pick on you guys about that. I remember, I'll never forget the wedding. I finally get to pronounce to you, Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Dow. It's like, Lord Jesus, it took long enough for you to talk to him or him to hear or, or whatever it took. Well, see, that wasn't the end. Then, then God opened the door and Jahim came into their life. Amen. Amen. I, I still remember, I remember, I remember Janice calling us and telling us that he had had to write something about what was going on in his life at home. And he wrote, we got cable. All the time. Yeah, all the time. I mean, he was so excited he had cable. And we've seen Jaheim grow and mature and bless and be a blessing to them, then be a blessing to him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Filling their hearts with joy, his heart with joy. All because she, at the beginning, decided to take what we preach on the, now what we preach, we, we preach the Bible. Yes. Right. About having what you say because the word of God promises you things. Took a hold of that. Yeah. Acted on that. And watched God bring her up. Amen. Amen. Now, y'all, some of y'all remember Diana. She, now she passed away. But when, before that, she got out of the projects. Yeah. She'd come for counseling, and we would, we would minister to her, and Janie would teach her. Janie took and made out a budget for it, helped her with her budget. And they, she, she couldn't get out of the projects, but she got out of them. Yeah. Glory, to God. Glory to God. And we could go through over time and time again and show you about people's lives that are, that are still with us or no longer with us. It, you know, I, we, we, I got people I run into all the time. Pastor Ed, we're still living on the teaching you gave us in the beginning. I'm thinking, why don't you come back and get some more? But anyway, <clears throat> you're the foundation in our life, praise God. Well, thank God we could be a foundation in somebody's life. But it's really not us, it's the word. The word is the foundation. The word creates the foundation. The word makes it happen. 
Why? Because whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, shall believe the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Then Jesus went on in verse 24 and kind of consolidated. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. Now the word desire there, it can be translated lust also. <coughs> Meaning a strong desire. I believe we have to have strong desires about the things of God. If you don't really have a heart to pursue it, you're not going to get it. You've got to be in pursuit of the things of God. As a deer panteth after the water, so my soul longeth for thee as in a dry and thirsty land. We want to pursue God. We want to pursue his promises. We want to, now, first pursuing him. His promises are the, are the goodies. He's our all in all. But then Jesus said, therefore I say unto you what things soever you desire when you pray. Now, the very interesting thing here, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. The word pray in the Greek is A-I-T-E-O, uh, A-T-O. Now, how many have ever been over to James and said, you have not because you ask not or you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust? The word ask is the same Greek word. Exact same word. So he says here, what things soever you desire when you pray or when you Ask, because it's translated ask over in James. Now praying in, in this particular instance would be asking. Amen? What things shall you desire when you pray, when you ask, believe you receive them. But what are you going to ask for? Anybody know? You're going to ask for the things God's word promises you. If, it doesn't, if he doesn't promise, you can't ask for it. Amen? Because your desire as a believer should be godly desire. Yes, that's right. That's right. And if you're going to the word, it's going to produce godly desire. Now, if you're going to the flesh and just have whims, I want this and I want that, just, and, you know, you start doing stupid stuff. You know, I, you know, I want... I remember we had one family back in our home church. They were believing God for a million dollars. They couldn't believe God for 20 cents. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun of them, but they would, they would do stupid things. They went to the airport one time. Finally, the airport authority ran them off because God told them to go. They packed up all the luggage. They sat at the airport for seven days, waiting for somebody to give them the money to go on a mission trip somewhere. Finally, they just told them they had to leave. They had no basis for faith for that. Hello? And, you know, some other things they did. They did, some, they did some stuff, you know, walked off, left all the textbooks at East Carolina's Mendenhall Student Center, told the angels to take care of them. And then got mad and stood up in church and argued with Pastor Zabowski about, uh, you know, that, that God didn't do what he said he would do because their angels, they, their books got stolen. No, they were stolen because you were too stinking lazy to carry them. Angels aren't sent to do what you're supposed to do. That's like me saying, angels, go cut my grass. Well, if you've got faith, it'll get done. That's not, there's no promise in the Bible that angels are going to cut my grass. I have no basis of faith. Well, you can have whatever you say, only if the Bible gives it to me. Only if the Word says it. Matter of fact, I can get angels to cut my grass, I'd have the best lawn in the city. Matter of fact, fertilize it, water it, cut it, trim it. I'd have them out there all the time. I long, you go out by my house, my lawnmower would go, nee, nee, nee. you'd say, who's on that lawnmower? Oh, that's Pastor Ed's house. His angels are out there cutting his grass. I have no basis for faith. See, we get silly when we don't stay with the Bible. Because then you start dreaming up all kinds of stuff. And the devil doesn't mind that if you get stupid. Why? Because it will ultimately hurt your faith. Why? Because you were declaring stuff you had no basis for faith for and it didn't happen. And then when you do go to the Bible and try to get the basis of faith for it, that's at the back of your mind. Well, I did this and it didn't work. Hello? Y'all hear you going home. Isn't that right? So what do we do? We, therefore, I say unto you, what things shall you desire? Our desires as a new creation, remember this one we talk, preached on, we preached this morning. Woo, praise God. It was good. I, I preached myself happy. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even rest when I got home. I was so happy. If you weren't here, go listen to it. It'll bless you. I might go back and listen to it myself. It was good. It blessed me. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. I mean, I, I got super blessed. Everybody say super blessed. All right. 
we're talking about living out of the newness of life, living out of the new man. See, as a new creation being, one who's governed by his spirit, not his flesh, your desire should not be governed by carnal, fleshly, uh, uh, fleshly lust. There's nothing wrong with having things, but when you get into the carnal lust over stuff, it has you. Amen. People don't commit adultery because they're walking with God. How do they do it? Because they're walking according to the dictates of the flesh. They're letting the lusts of their flesh determine. And you see, the Bible, if, you, if, if you get into the Word of God, you're, you're, the Word of God just won't let you do stuff to appease the flesh. It's always pulling you up. What? Set your affections. I believe Colossians chapter 3, maybe verse 2. That might be, it might not be. But set your affections on things above and not on, the, on things of the earth. What? Set your affections on things above. Our desire should be on the things of God. Now, God doesn't mind you have being prosperous, and he'll lead you into prosperity, but it'll be uh, establishing his covenant in the earth. He wants us to help reach people. God doesn't want to make you rich. This, this aggravates me. You get people going out selling books and all this kind of stuff, living in $2 million mansions and all this kind of stuff, and they're telling everybody else they got to be poor. That's just not right. And, and at what point do you say enough is enough? Well, it's one thing to be able to have a multi-million dollar mansion. It's another thing to say, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to reach the world with the gospel. I'm going I'm to build churches in Africa for $10,000 a church. I'm going to go to Haiti and I'm going to feed, you know, these many children for the kingdom and get these kids saved at a young age. I'm going to support Marion Zirkel down in Guatemala. And we're going to do missions campaigns. We're going to do all this kind of stuff. We're just going to do, 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 and do, and do, and do, and do, and do for the kingdom of God. And I can live comfortable in, you know, in a $700,000 house or whatever. I mean, you know, I don't have to have a $7 million house. There's so much I can do for God with that. Now, on the other side, you don't want to get on the other side. Well, you know, we got to live in a little shanty on the wrong side of the tracks, all run down, you know, with the chickens running under the house. You can see them in the winter through the cracks. That's not, that's not what God wants. We are God's kid. God wants us blessed. But I think as a believer, we, should, we, could, we ought to find some, some place of um, moderating that where we say, you know, this is enough. I don't have to have $17 million dollars stored in the bank so I can live a bit high on the hog. Man, I could, I could live and, and, and bless God's kingdom and help build church in America. We could build churches in America. Right. Amen? You know, jet setting all over the place. I don't ride in coach. I ride in first class. And listen, if you got the money riding in first class or business, I don't blame you. If you got a long trip. But you know what? Like one guy, you know, one guy called me and said, we want to come minister in your church and your fuel will get there from California. It's $4,500. You are joking, right? Well, God, we believe God for a plane. Well, then believe God for your fuel. Hello. I'm serious. You can believe God for the plane and, and, and put off on God that he gave you that airplane. You can put off on God that he took care of the fuel too. Yeah, that went over big. Well, you know, Na 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 na. Hey hey hey! Don't bother. You know, instead of goodbye, they didn't even get here. <laughs> so I'm sorry. You know, if God told you to come, you can come. But I ain't paying forty five hundred dollars. I don't have it to fly you out here to do what you said God told you to do. Did He really tell you? Are you gonna let that stand in your way? Are you gonna trust God that He'll supply the fuel some other way? They didn't come anyway. Praise the Lord. So what are we going to do? We're going to stay with the word. We're going to do the word. We're going to have desires out of the word. And then we're going to live that way. And God will bless you. I said God will bless you. He'll take care of you. He'll increase you. But there's, you know, it's all honesty. It, you know, you kind of get to place, you know, how much bigger TV do I need? Honestly. Now, my mother-in-law bought us one, you know. She wanted us to have one. She, she said, I got a 55-inch flat panel in the bonus room. I didn't buy it. My mother-in-law bought it for me, you know. And, um, you know, finally, we, 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 we did break down. We finally bought our own, the first flat panel we bought for ourselves a year ago. Our bonus, our, our downstairs family room had a little 32-inch. You couldn't even see it from the kitchen. You were like this trying to see the, 
what the score was on the TV. I mean, you had to get out a pair of binoculars to see the score from where the kitchen was, and they had one on really, really, really good sale at H.H. H. Gregg. I bought a 50-inch flat panel for, for well under 1000 like It was like, actually, it was about $500. And I cut my cabinet down and redid it because it wouldn't fit in the cabinet. So I had to cut the cabinet off and redo it. And it looks like it was, came from the factory that way. Put the TV on top of it. Now I can see, I can see it in the kitchen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, it's the only one we've ever bought for ourselves. Everything else has been given to us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're, we're grateful to all the gifts over the years. Praise the Lord. And um, how God blessed us. But, you know, you kind of you know, you start going, do I need an 80-inch in the bonus room? Do I need a 90-inch? Jerry says, yes. <laughs> but at some point in time, you know, I'm going to have to raise the roof on the bonus room. It cost me $20,000 so I can get the bigger TV in there. I got slanted roofs in my bonus room. Hallelujah. I'm going to have to go out there and do, redo a whole reconstruction so I can get the bigger TV. It, you know, how, remember Madame Blueberry on the uh, yeah. VeggieTales? She kept collecting, kept collecting, kept collecting, kept collecting, and finally just crushed everything. At some point in time, we come to a maximum sustained lifestyle that we need to live, and we got to say, we got to keep giving to God. It's not all about me, you know? And I'm going to tell you something. We, we bought into the lie, and, a lot of, and I, I probably have said these things, that, you know, the world's going to be impressed with your, your financial status. Your house doesn't break the yoke. Your car doesn't break the yoke. You can be living in a tent on the back side over at the campground and be anointed. Well, the rich man ain't going to listen to you. The anointing. When you speak under the anointing, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. We have to trust the anointing more than our car. We trust the anointing more than our house. Well, it opens the door. He did, Jesus just said, go preach the gospel. He didn't say, go take pictures of your house and show it to them so that you have a, you're now qualified to talk to them. But if I've ever said anything along that line, I repent because I was wrong. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. And of course, we don't know because 400 of our sermons got wiped out. So we won't be able to go back and find out. 14 years got wiped out. That's all right. Words fresh and new. We could preach the same sermon again. They'd be fresh and anointed for the day. Hallelujah. All right. So we're going to live according to the word, speak the word, do the word, live the word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to quit right there. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or Using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.